Okay, we are up here at the range and we're ready to do some shooting. Okay. Absolutely. Be 405 grain lumps of lead. Yeah, <laughs> sounds great to me. It's a pretty big chunk of lead. 405 grains of old American freedom. You got it. We're ready to put a few rounds to these rifles. I think we're ready to put a few rounds to these rifles. Well, I'm ready. Oh. Are you ready? I think, yeah, I think I'm ready. How's your shoulder? I, I guess, yeah, we'll find out pretty quick here. Actually, they're pretty mild to shoot. You'll be surprised. Okay, yeah, I hope so. Uh, all right, so we got two versions here. We've got the long, and the, we've got the rifle and the carbine, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. What do we want to What do we want to shoot first? It's up to you, but I'd start with the carbine. I think it's the most fun. Okay. We're going to shoot Glenn's favorite first. <laughs> All right, let's do it. First things first, you want to have the hammer on half cock like it is there now. That allows you to be able to lift up the lever to load it. So go ahead, lift up the lever. Just let it lay, the, lay there. Since you want the nickel plated yeah, brass, we'll I let like you use it. one of those. I do like it. Go ahead and put it in there and We're thumb it all the way in. Slide that all the way in. Yep. Now go ahead and close that down. There you go. Okay. Now it's loaded. It's not ready to fire yet. You're going to have to go ahead and cock the hammer all the way back till it stops. Okay. And then it's ready to fire. It has a very light trigger. It's a single action trigger. So right. keep your finger off of the trigger until you're ready to shoot it, of course. But go ahead and cock the hammer back. I appreciate the trigger warning. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now it's ready to fire, just like that. Okay. So go ahead and shoulder it. Uh, this is tending to shoot a little bit high at this distance. So just kind of aim a little bit low there and we'll see where you where you put it. Okay, I'm going to try and put it on that silhouette plate at 100. That red one down there? Okay. Yeah. Well, I missed it. Did anyone see where I hit? I was watching you. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little smoky. Yeah. That felt nice. That felt really That's nice. That's not bad. Yeah. It really is. It's really surprising the first time a lot of people shoot these. Yeah. Okay, go ahead and put the hammer on half cock. Okay. Like this? And then flip it up and the, the shell's going to kick out. Nope, not all the way. Cue the shell. The shell's going to kick out. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead and close it down. Let's see if it'll catch it. And... Okay, this is one of the problems that they had. Uh, one of the things that they talk about with Custer with the shells being stuck where they used a knife to pry it out so it just stuck a little bit probably because there's a little bit of wax on the on those shells yeah all right but that's only going to happen once yep generally don't have that happen wow go ahead and load it up and try it again let's see okay it shot pretty easy i'm going to watch where you you're aiming at this or shooting at this time see yeah. if you can tell where you hit appreciate that Just above it. Just a little high. An wow. inch above it. Wow, okay. So like I said, this side is set for a little bit high. Yeah, you weren't kidding. But now keep in mind that 200 yards would probably be right on. Yeah. This is this is a cartridge that will go, you know, 800,000, 1,500 yards. Yeah, I'm surprised by that. It shoots with a rainbow trajectory, though, so you have to be ready for that. Yeah, I was for sure overestimating the drop on that. Yeah. Half cock? Half cock it. <laughs> yeah, there we go. That's the way it's supposed to work. That's how it goes. That was <laughs> satisfying. Yep. Well, do you want to try one of the rifles? I think I do, yeah. Okay. Let's shoot that long guy. Everything's the same other than the length and the weight. It's going to open the same. You're going to do the same loading procedure. You notice it's a lot more front end heavy. Yeah. Yeah, she's heavy. This is actually the first one that I got. Way, way back, back when. How many rounds do you think are through these guns? No way to tell. No way to tell. I have contributed a few rounds to it, let's just say. Yeah, yeah, I bet you have. You're good at that. All right. Like how far out do I hold this? <laughs> ah, you hit it. <laughs> so loud. <laughs> Oh, dude, that's awesome. That's a freight train going down there instead of a, yeah, that's serious. a little Volkswagen or something. And the, 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 the trigger is nice. Yeah. It's pretty nice. Yeah, it's a straight single action, so you don't have any creep at all. Uh, it's just, just light nice and crisp. And crisp. No yeah. travel at all. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah, that's nice. Pop that. Oh, I need to come back a little more. Yeah. There she goes. So what do you think of them? That's awesome. And I, yeah, I, I want to, I want to stretch it out. You well, know, go like, ahead. we got a lot more ammo. I mean, I want to. All the distance? Yeah, you know, like. Well, we could go on the hill there and shoot down to the valley. <laughs> no? Okay. Oh, I guess we won't. When the cameras are off, maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs>
Um, yeah, I'm just so interested in how that does at two, three, four, five hundred mm -hmm. yards. Yep. Why don't you go ahead and fire up the carbine again and let's see how you, now that you know it's shooting a little bit high, let's see if you can go ahead and hit it. Let's try it again. Okay, crank it back. Just below it. I think I got it on the little. On the ricochet kick, there, yeah. up a little <laughs> dust on that. Yeah, hit low. This is your favorite one. This is your Vegas desert walkabout gun. Absolutely. We, yes. I, I take a handful of shells and I go wandering out in the desert, and a little bit of water too, of course. Yeah. And uh, it was just for a good afternoon. Okay. Now, are, do you have any good desert walkabout stories that come to mind that you can tell us on camera? Probably better not. That'll be maybe for our, uh, I don't know, our Patreon series. I don't know. What, I don't know what people do. Exclusive content. We can tell you about the Gila monsters and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's see if I can hit it now. A little high. A little high. Yeah. Just a little high. They go high. And they're pretty close. Yeah, just barely right. He's a smooth operator with that rifle, though. Well, I do have a few rounds through it. <laughs> yep, right there. I think just right at the belly button of it. Dang. That's fun though. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Did, yeah. Pop that time. Yeah, that's close though. This is close, yeah. yeah. Dang. It's just left. That gun is long. Yeah, it is. A little harder to hold with that extra weight on the end. Put it in nose first, right into that hole there. Put it in with your thumb, just push it up forward. Okay, now go ahead and close the door down. Squeeze it down. Okay, now that, that's down. And then you're going to go ahead and cock that back. Now this is a, a single action, so keep your finger off the trigger. Cock it back and it'll stay. And it's going to be a real light, short trigger pull before it fires. Okay. You hit it! First shot, Hugo. <laughs> Classic Hugo, dude. Cock the hammer back. Flip that up. There you go. Sweet. Were you paying attention? I was. Okay, good. It's already open for me too. Hey. Everybody's hitting it but me. What is this? <laughs> That's beautiful. I want one. Dude, that thing <laughs> slaps that steel so hard. <laughs> This is awesome. I love history. Well, that's a real life piece of history in your hand. Hey, Woo! there we go. Heard that one. The size of this is really nice. You know, I mean, we talk about how our carbines now, the barrels are shorter and whatever, but and it, like it is it's a really nice really manageable size mm -hmm. i get why it's your favorite yeah 
Just left? Yeah, black powder is just quite a bit different than smokeless powder in the way that it burns and the recoil. It's more of a big push. Yeah, it's just a push. And, you know, even bigger cartridges than this, and there were a lot of bigger cartridges than this, or even muzzle loaders, uh, are going to be a lot milder to shoot in that you don't have the same impulse, recoil impulse, it's spread out over a few milliseconds longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you can feel that, how the, mm -hmm. the time is, it's milliseconds, so... It's, yeah, you couldn't measure it. But. Yeah, it still see, seems like a gunshot, but it really has like a there's it's like a slower push mm -hmm. than just like a like a hard kick like a, yeah I think we're used to with guns it's so interesting and I noticed a little hesitancy at first for some of the guys shooting it thinking that it was going to be a high recoil like some of the other 4570 the more modern loads on it uh, this is a very pleasant load to shoot yeah for everybody it really is yeah I was expecting it to kick like my Mosin or something similar no. to that and Entirely just, different. Entirely different. And there's recoil. I mean, everybody gets muzzle rise, but like it's just softer than that. It's yep. just it's just a nice little push. Yep. You shoot it all day. Yeah. We need more of that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So with the trap door, what's the reload time on it? Like, how fast did they normally reload these? Uh, with training, they were required to fire 12 rounds a minute, 12 aimed rounds a minute. Cut. Which isn't really hard to do. Let's see how fast we can get one. Sure. Oh, attack reload from Carl. All right. Wish I would have brought the shot timer. <laughs> give you a beat. All right. One. Oh no! It was a good reload. Great seconds between the first and second shot. I think Mark had a faster time than me on that. All right, what is up everybody? Welcome back to the channel. Justin here with DTT, and once again, graciously joined by our good friend, Glenn Parshall. Thanks for being here again. Absolutely, it's always fun to come over. <clears throat> it's always fun to have you come over. It is a new week, we have a new gun. Not a new gun. Uh, these are pretty old, I mean, by comparison, so yeah, they're not really new. Yeah. Maybe new to you. Maybe new to some of our viewers. Yeah, new to me for sure. You sent me what we were going to talk about and I had very little reference. So I had to really look it up to know kind of what we were talking about. So I just thought it'd be a real popular one to look at. It's kind of an iconic uh, uh, gun from a great long time in our American history past. Oh yeah. I just thought it'd be fun to look at these. Yeah, I'm very excited to talk about this for a few reasons. We're sh straying a little bit from our <clears throat> uh, submachine gun formula moving into something very different so first things first just why don't you just tell us what we have here on the table in front of us well we have different versions of the Springfield trapdoor rifle uh, this was something that they started developing in 1866 a guy by the name of uh, Erskine Allen was the the head armor at Springfield Armory and he was tasked with coming up with a new type of gun uh, Primarily the War of Northern Aggression was fought with muzzleloaders and they were obsolete long before the war was over but they had a lot of them and they basically turned them into scrap steel for the most part. Uh, if you go to a place called Bannerman Island which is off the East River in New York they actually used barrel, rifle barrels as rebar in the concrete when they were putting in the dock and what have you because they had all of these things that were not going to be being used wow. for, you know, for anything. So they had a very small budget so the idea was to take existing guns and do some conversion to t change it over to a fixed metallic cartridge. And there were, there were five different uh, 
versions that came out first as they were refining it and what have you before they finally adopted in 1873, you know, this type. So it, it, it went through a, quite a development stage. It was up against all the Remington rolling block was another one in, in, in the trial in 1870, that, uh, or 71 that was up against. And uh, they were all single shot rifles, but that was, at the time, was quite a, a, a marked change and advance in technologies from a muzzle loader, which takes significant time to reload. Uh, you could do you know 10 or 15 rounds a minute with one of these when you got good. That was a big deal. A very big deal, yeah. <laughs> very, very big deal. So uh, uh, came about, it's a very powerful cartridge. Now the first ones, the very first ones were 58 caliber rimfire. Uh, they, they took the, the muskets, they took the barrels off, and they, they, they put on a different action on the back end of it here. They call it trapdoor because of the way that it opens, the action opens up. The first ones were a rimfire. Now, the, the one problem you have, or one of many problems you have with the rimfire, is you're limited to very low pressure round because you have to have a casing that's soft enough to pinch with a hammer to fire it, but still strong enough to hold the explosion of the gunpowder in there. Yeah. So there's a limit of how much. Now you can get some fairly powerful cartridges, but a center fire cartridge is by far something that you could develop with a lot higher pressure, a lot higher velocity, a lot more energy. Cool. So the, just the very f first ones were with the rim fire, then they went with a center fire. Now the first center fire that they came out with was the 5070. Basically had 50 grains of black powder, uh, excuse me, 50 caliber and 70 grains of black powder. Uh, this is one of the projectiles from it. Uh, this is one that we, we cast a lot. This is a, a, a Lyman product, that the mold that I used to cast these. But it put a big chunk of lead. They're 500 grains. And it would go down range with a very authoritative hit when it did. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, as they kept on developing, the, the 50 caliber had a really severe angle with, with a rainbow for the tra tra trajectory. So they ended up going with a 45 caliber instead when they came out in 1873. A little smaller diameter, a little better, better ballistic coefficient, but with that same energy. It had the same weight of the bullet. The first ones were a 500 grain bullet. These are loaded with a 405 grain bullet, which was the carbine load. The 500 was a rifle load. I just find the 405s to be more pleasant to shoot, so that, that's what I cast up and load. Um, that's what it was issued through the late 18, uh, just shy of 1890. Uh, the front one down there is one that was made in 1889, so they, they kept on with the same caliber for quite some time. So these are all before; these are all pre-1900. Yes, yes. Um, how does this compare to the 4570 round that we currently are more familiar with? Well, the 4570 round today is the same cartridge, but it's loaded uh, a much hotter load. Okay. Uh, there's three basic levels that they load 4570 in. And this takes the lightest load, it's a black powder load, lo lowest pressure. If you were to put one of the hot end uh, hunting loads in it, it'd blow this gun apart. Uh, well, I mean, the metallurgy of the know. day, the type of action has a little weakness with the, with the, the way that it hinges and what have you. Uh, it was great for the time, but the, we've had a lot of advancements, not only in guns and steel, but in gunpowder. Mm -hmm. You know, our gunpowder today puts out a lot more energy than the black powder that was loaded with it way back when. Cool. Um, so I like talking about Muskets, I like talking about muzzle loaders because the first gun I ever had was a, uh, a Hawken rifle, mm -hmm. 50 cal Hawken rifle, I think. Probably uh, everybody's first muzzle loader. <laughs> maybe, yeah. Uh, I, I thought about bringing it today and I forgot. I wish I would have brought it just to kind of line it up here. But these, with some, with some obvious differences, I mean, these look reminiscent of that for sure. Well, then they are, and a lot of the parts were used. If you look at this lock plate here, it's dated 1864. That was a lock plate on one of the 58 caliber muskets. So, you know, they, they used the parts that they could and, and, and changed the action a little bit and what have you to, 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 to come up with it. Um, they sleeved a lot of them. There were a lot of that going on. They did the sharps rifles the same way. Uh, they yeah, they, they the took sharps. them and converted them over to a center fire cartridge. Yeah. And that was a lot cheaper and a lot faster and a lot easier than, than, than building a whole new gun, a lot cheaper, and they didn't have the budget for it. So um, one of the things that a lot of the uh, guns were turned into, was they made what's called foragers. They were taking bore out, and we're talking about the muzzleloaders, taking bore it out and make it into a shotgun, muzzleloading shotgun. 
and they sold those for you know three dollars or something like that. And a lot of people got them when they were coming out west. That way they could go ahead and, and, and hunt birds and things of that sort. It was a fairly inexpensive gun. It didn't require cartridges, which they had a harder time getting than just the gunpowder. I mean, they could even load it full of rocks if they needed to, to you know, to take a, a grouse or, or, or a pheasant or something. And uh, a way to survive. Dude, that's awesome. Way to survive. Yeah, I think sometimes I do think, you, you know, you talk about the different, uh, the different weights of the bullets and the different powder loads and different things here. It's so crazy to me to think that, like, uh, I had that muzzle loader. I was 16, 17 years old. Mm-hmm. I had that thing, and, I mean, I shot bullets out of it that looked very similar to this. Yeah, that's 50 caliber. Yeah, so. I, mean, this, yeah. I mean, I really played a lot with different amounts of powder, mm-hmm. knowing basically nothing about that, <laughs> right? Like, if I felt like getting crazy, then I would... Put a bunch of powder oh, in. Oh yeah, we've we've all done that kind of thing. Don't feel bad, <laughs> you know. But it, yeah, it's just it's crazy that I was just yeah I was just young and just playing around with, with different different loads, knowing very little about what I was doing. Uh, but yeah, I mean, so much of what I learned, so much of my early like firearms experience and what I learned about shooting was based on that shooting mm-hmm. that shooting that muzzle loader. Which was awesome and, and very, like, a, a lot of fun in its own way. Well, it is, and you probably learned a lot better doing that because you had a single shot. It took effort to, to load it, effort to shoot it, and what have you, so you concentrated on your accuracy and doing everything right. Yeah. If we have something, the high-capacity magazine is bam, 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 it, it, it's all gone. You people don't learn to do the shooting that way. Yeah. Not nearly as well, I don't think. Yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> so we've established these are all pre-1900. You kind of touched on this, but what was the original reason that that the first one of these was brought into existence and, and created? Well, by the end of the war, it was realized that other countries, Great Britain and other countries around the world, had already gone to a metallic cartridge. And it was, it was recognized that we're no longer going to be using mus- muzzle loaders for a lot of things. So this was a way to get into it, and again, on a low budget. They had the parts and what have you. You know, the sight is off of a, a musket, the lock plate's off of a musket, so they could use a lot of the same parts and not have to remake them so they could make it for, I don't know, a dollar instead of three dollars or some, some figure like that. Got it. And, and put it together. Uh, as things went along, they found, well, this works and this didn't work, so they would change it. They'd make modifications. Like I said, this is the fifth model on, on this one. This is in 5070. This is actually the scarcest one I've got. Uh, this, they, 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 they made just a very few thousand of these before they w- went over to the 4570 and 1873. But I had to have one of these. I, I'm a fan of the 5070. I've got the other rifles that 5070s that the U.S. military used over the years as well. So I had to have all of them. So I yeah, had one of these. Too. Absolutely. <laughs> but if you notice, take a look at the difference here between the sights. Now, this is a, the early muzzle loader type sight, which is basically just, let's see if I can get it to pop up here. Well, it's basically just, uh, there, there we go. It's basically just a sheet of steel, and if you longer distance, you flip it up, and it would give you a taller sight. Uh, that's crude, but it would work for some things. But there's a lot better way to do sights. So is this another one? That's another one for if further distance. If you're shooting yeah. even farther, you uh-huh. got a taller one. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. But that, that is still kind of crude by comparison. This is the first type of a sight that came out on the, the, the trap doors here. You, you move this back and forth here, and it would go up and down these, yeah, these rails. Kind of and you could also, for, for really long distance, you could get it that way. So the 4570 has kind of a rainbow trajectory as well. Uh, they're effective out over a mile. There, wow. there have been some, some fantastic shots. I'm not that good, but there's some fantastic shots that will take over a mile on. Uh, they When they had the rifles and carbines, now the carbines are a lot lighter and a lot handier and more preferred to be used than the rifles, but they, they issued the rifles but they carried the carbines. So you see these are generally in a lot uh, worse condition, a lot more wear because they got used a lot more. Yeah. But they also had some differences. I don't know if you can see here right here on the side, see that C? That's the carbine sight. Uh-huh. And it would have the rifle sight and it would have different increments and different calibrations on it. Uh, then that would be used on the longer barrel rifle because you wouldn't have quite the same trajectory on it. Yeah, but you yeah. see that's marked out to 800 yards. Okay. That's pretty pretty fair distance down the road. And then you stand it up if you want to go further than that. Later on, they came out with this type of a sight. This is called a Buffington sight. And it had, this, this is kind of frozen in here, but several things. This screw would turn and the base would, would pivot back and forth. 
so you could get your windage in there, and then your elevation, you raise this up or down, or you went ahead and used the the, the, the uh, rear sight here as wow. it was folded down. So this so, is when we start to see like really early adjustable exactly, yeah. sights. And uh, the, it made, made shooting these a lot better for distance, a much better sight. I mean, you look at the peepholes that are on them, they're fairly small, uh, the, the beginning of peephole sights yeah, which were used in the US military rifles. After not that. super easy to look through. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it became better and better. They made some improvements, they changed some things. Uh, you know, for instance, this is what they call a high arch on the, on the action here. If you look on the inside here, you see this is scalloped out quite high. Well, that kind of weakened it a little bit, so they went with a low arch later on, and that gave more strength to the, to the breech block. Uh, different firing pin materials. Uh, they found that uh, if you had oil and what have you, and you let it sit with a hammer down, that it could freeze. Uh, by freeze, I mean the firing pin would be locked into place and it's protruding. So you drop a shell in it and it's got a protruding firing pin and you Close hit it hard, it. you could make it go off. Yeah. So they changed the materials that the, the firing pins were made out of. They changed the material the casings were made out of. One of the, the common stories about Custer at the Little Bighorn was that they were using the copper casings, which this is a copper casing here. This is an original one. Uh, this is, uh, let me see if I can read the date on the back of it here. Uh, this was made in 1886. And they felt, the story is that these would get stuck in the chambers when they got hot and dirty and they were using pocket knives to pry them out. There were some instances of that, but not to the extent that people like to do the historical lore about it. Later on, they went ahead and changed over to the brass casings. Now these are balloon head cartridges, which are a lot weaker than what we have today. Basically it was formed, so you have your primer here, you have the side wall, and then it would come up around the primer and go back down. So the, the, the casing is very thin back here in the back end of it. it. Today we have a, a solid head where that whole thing would have been filled in with the brass, so it would take a lot higher pressures. You've got a steel chamber to control the pressures here, and the, the heavier, thicker brass plug on the back end of it would control the back and the back end so you could get a, a, a hotter round out of it. These were some guns. Many of these came out of a buy that I made many years ago. I was uh, running the gun shop for the Pawn Stars. Oh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, which I did, I'm my wife and I did. Glad for we're a touching time. on that little portion yeah. of your life just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I met a guy, I was doing a, a gun shows around on the road at the time, and I, I met a guy that was buying out a movie studio, a rental company, and he had a lot of these. So I ended up buying uh, my first buy on the trapdoors was about seven dozen of them. I can't do. You math. don't buy two. You buy a lot. I can't do the math, but that's a lot of. <laughs> that's a, that's, that's a, a bunch, lot of rifles. Yeah. And I bought a bunch of Winchester 92s, about the same amount. Uh, a lot of the the trapdoors had been converted into to look like uh, muskets, or you know the the uh, all from like uh, the uh, Pilgrim era with a, with a flared oh, yeah. end on them, and they would weld things on them and they would cut them off and they do things to them. These are original carbine actions, but this is a rifle stock that's been cut down. You can see on here the, the fill-in where the, the ramrod was. And they would take them apart. This has got, you see the stampings on here. I had one of them which I uh, regrettably sold a while back uh, that had Warner Brothers Studio stamped on the side of it. It was in their stable for some time. Wow. But these have been road hard and put away wet, uh, thrown on the ground, dropped off of stagecoaches, you name it. They've been beat up and abused, but they still function, they still run. We shoot them. still shoot them. Yep, they, they do. Um, this is one of the very last ones here that came out. Now this has the hood hooded on the front sight, which is a, a little bit uh, harder to find. Um, this is uh, about 1884. And then the very front one is kind of an unusual one. That's one, this particular one was made in 1889. You can tell the dates on these by looking here on the stocks. You see the cartouches on them. Now this one was made in 1891. That's the cartouche that's on it. Cool. And this one was in, 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 in 89 when it was made. That probably has it, but it's probably beat, a little, beat the crap. A little <laughs> worn down. That's for sure the most worn out. Oh yeah, it, it is, it is. Uh, this is the one that I enjoy shooting the most. It's, it's, I probably, I don't know how many hundreds of rounds that I've run through it, but uh, uh, it, it works very, very, very well for me. So, But this one, I'm going on by, it's a little bit unusual. This is called the rod bayonet model. They had a cleaning rod, and they turned it into a bayonet by making a pointy front end on it. And it was just an experimental thing. They didn't make a whole lot of them. It was just a couple of years after this that they uh, came out with a different type rifle. We went with the first with the Winchester Hotchkiss. 
and then we went to the the crags. Yeah, cool. Yeah, because these are clearly these come out all the way, and they're yep. clearly well, this will just... come out all the way too if we go on. Oh, if you need it was to. designed to be a cleaning rod as well, but uh, you would lock. It's got these notches here, so it would lock into place for a bayonet. Wow. So a little yeah, bit more unusual. The the carbine, it's it for sure feels much more practical. It is. These it ones is. are they're so long and heavy. Um, which yeah, was, was still, I'm sure, like good for the time. Oh yeah, you've probably seen the uh, famous picture of Geronimo sitting there with 1873 carbine across his lap. Yeah, I think I have. Yep, uh, they were very commonly used by pretty much everybody in the West. So, uh, explain the explain the action. Obviously, we have like the hammer here. Mm -hmm. Where's the firing pin? How do we? impact the round that's in there. You have a hammer here and you put it to load it, you put it back here and then you lift up on the lever here. Now the cartridge would go ahead and I'm not going to fully load it but the cartridge would go ahead and slip on into there and then you would close it down. The firing pin is enclosed in the inside here and you can probably see right here on the front of it. Let me see if I can poke it out a little bit here. And you can see the tip of it right there. Okay. Now here again they, they changed materials a few times so that they did, didn't have the firing pin freeze where it would lock into place. You can see that protrudes quite a bit there, and if it was frozen because the hammer had been down on it, it when you go to close it and hit it hard, you could make it go yeah, off. Yeah, you basically so, have like a kind of a slam fire situation. Yeah, exactly. So they, they, things kept changing and developing. You notice I showed you the, the high arch. This is one of the lower arches where not as much of the metal was scalloped out of the thing there. But basically then you go ahead and load it with the cartridge in it. You go ahead and bring this back to full cock, and then you, you fire it. Oh, yeah. And when you go ahead and cock it again, flip this up and open it, it would kick out the old shell and you drop a new one in. So you can reload it and shoot it fairly fast. Wow, dude. How nice. That I'm sure people were like losing their minds that they could like pop that open and it would shoot the casing out and then reload mm -hmm. another one. Every, everything happens right here. Mm -hmm. yep. like, <laughs> I can just imagine people were so pumped. Well, I said the competitor of the era, the prime competitor of the United States was the Remington Rolling Block, which did something similar. You, you flip the lever and the, the door would come back down and then it would come out and then you load it and you flip it back up there and cock the hammer and do the same kind of thing. Uh, a different way to get to the same point. The advantage is you don't have th this weak hinge point here, which if you've dropped it or hit it just far, you can break it right there. So uh, the, the rolling block is a little stronger from that standpoint. That's another fun gun. We may have to do an episode on rolling blocks one of these days. I'm not against that at all. I might have one or two. <laughs> or seven dozen. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't often buy seven dozen of anything at once, but uh, that, was, that was a whole fun time. These yeah. are an antique rifle, which means if you find one, uh, they can ship it right to you. You don't have to go through a gun dealer. This is not a gun by the federal laws as far as anything that would be required to go through a dealer. Got it. So it's uh, it's. Uh, and they are serialized. They're not serialized. They, they are. Okay. They are serialized. Uh, you look back here. Well, let's look at this one here. The serial number's right there. Oh, got it. And you can look up the serial number to see what years there's charts there to show you what years they were made. And they made a lot of them, so there's, there's a higher serial numbers than what you might imagine on them. But they were issued uh, and, and used all over the West cool. for many, many, many years. And continue on up, uh, they issued them to some things in the United States during World War I, whether regarding train stations and things like that, they were still issuing them. And they're still us using them today in the U.S. military. There's a, the last time I checked, they still had it. There was a, an active duty Army unit at Fort, at Fort Scott, Kansas, reenactor unit, and they're issued the trapdoor as their issue rifle. Wow. They dress up in, in cavalry uh, you know, uniforms and what have you, and they carry the trapdoors. So it's still considered to be an active duty issued gun, still you know, 150 years. <laughs> Quite some time. That's wild. Quite some time. These are great guns. These are a lot of fun to shoot. They're, they're easy to maintain, um, easy to repair if you should break something. Just quite a joy to shoot. So, as far as it being uh, like standard issue, I mean, what were what what were these things used for the most? They were the general issue. Now, during the war, you had fifty or hundred different types of guns. They could buy three hundred of this gun and five hundred of that gun. They would issue them. So you find a vast, big variety of guns that were issued during the war. Afterwards, they were trying to standardize and have one gun. This was. 
This was the gun for the U.S. military in the in the 1880s and 1870s. Okay. And then, as I said, they, they changed a little bit later. They they first went to the Winchester Hotchkiss, which is in 4570. And that was the first bolt-action repeating rifle. And then they went to the Krag uh, almost immediately after that. The Hotchkiss wasn't, uh, is another one that there wasn't a lot issued of. We'll have to let you shoot that one someday, too. Yeah, we might have to look into it. <laughs> 4570 is one of my favorite numbers. I've got a lot of different guns, lever action, uh, these type of guns. I've got a revolver that's chambered in it. Uh, it's just a real fun all-around cartridge. Sounds like really maybe uh, maybe one day we'll have to just do like a forty-five seventy highlight. Yeah, we could do that. And look at all the different And it's still very platforms. popular today. You go out and oh, try yeah. to find one of the Marlin 1895 4570s right now. You can't because they're so popular they can't make them fast enough yeah. to supply the market on them. Yeah, that was the, that was the, uh, that's the dinosaur gun. <laughs> the the Marlin one, 4570. One of them, very much so. Yeah, it was in the in the Jurassic the Jurassic World movie. Chris mm -hmm. Pratt running around with the lever action 4570. Yep. Well, if I ever got a chance to go buffalo hunting, this is what I would take. Really? Yep. Absolutely, I'd take this this very one right here. Um, I long thought about putting in for a tag, you know, to go buffalo hunting. I just well, thought yeah. it'd be kind of iconic thing to to uh, go ahead and harvest a, a, a buffalo with, with one of my trapdoors. Yeah, just to hunt a buffalo with one of the biggest buffalo hunters of all time. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. We talk about high capacities today, high capacity magazines and things of that sort, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 rounds. Why don't you hand me the uh, leather pouch there? This is a McKeever pouch. This was issued and they would put it on the belt. It holds 20 rounds. So when they would carry it like this, closed up and latched up, and then get into combat, it would open up, and you pull the individual cartridges out, and you got 20 rounds there. And here again, you could fire 10 or 15 rounds a minute, so that's not a lot of times worth of ammo. But uh, that was here again a whole lot faster than the muzzle loading yeah. that, that, that this replaced. So <clears throat> this is an original one. It's you know 150 year old leather. You can still see the embossing on there, the U.S. Yeah. You can see that on the back here the manufacturer's name and everything. So it's it's kind of remarkable that it's still in good condition. I, I got this in an estate sale, oh, I can say probably back in the 18, in the 80s. Very cool. There are people that collect the tools, that's their collection. There are people that collect sights. I don't know how many times I've come across a nice rifle and the sight was missing, the rear sight, because somebody sold the sight off. The sight sometimes is worth more than the gun. I got one rifle that I picked up a number of years ago and I actually paid more for the sight to replace it than I did for the gun. <laughs> <laughs> because it, it's a very rare sight, so. Any questions on the use or operation or history on these that you can think of? Wow, we covered a lot of ground. We did. The, these were covered a lot of ground in time. I mean, these were used for a lot of years in a lot of, a lot of ways, a lot of places. Uh, they, they had line throwing charges that they would use. So if you had two ships that come up uh, out on the water, they could throw a rope, you know, fire a rope over to connect with one heavy. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're a very useful gun for a lot of different things. Um, I have heard, I have I've read... Uh, I have not been able to totally verify it, but I, I believe it to be accurate. Uh, you remember in 1970, you wouldn't remember that though, but 1972 when the, uh, uh, the Palestinians grabbed the Israeli athletes at the Munich Olympics, okay. the, uh, the Israelis that came in to rescue them got in one of the towers that were across the way and fired a suppressed trapdoor with that big 500 grain bullet, it would plow through that plate glass and take out the sentries. Oh wow! And so, so be quiet enough that they didn't uh, alert the other you know people inside the building. Yeah, because these are not super fast rounds. No, the 405 grain bullet comes out at about 1,200 feet per second. So you bump that up to a 500 grain, you're right about that sonic level, and it's a very predictable trajectory. So you know you've got. 200 yards, you can t tell what the point of impact is going to be. So it makes it very accurate from that standpoint. And being a subsonic round, it's a lot easier to suppress than a supersonic round. I'm going to have to find more information about that. But I have read that a couple of places in the past. Yeah. When I first like looked at it, like my very first impression was that they were actually directly converting muskets to these trapdoor rifles. And they did. That's exactly what they did. Okay. Yeah. They took the, the, the 1864, 1865 muskets, put this breech block action on the back of them and used a lot of the other parts, used the barrel or relined the barrel for different calibers. And yeah, that's what they did. This, Like I said, this lock plate here, 1864, that came off of a musket. Cool. So it's exactly what they did. So where did we, where do we kind of go from here? Well, the bolt action came about after that. Like I said, the Winchester Hotchkiss was the first bolt action repeating rifle, then, then the, the uh, Krag. And they had several versions of the Craig, and then 1903 they came out with the Springfield, and then the, the 1917 with with the Enfield. 
So that, that was the kind of progression of things. And by World War II, we're still using bolt-action rifles. We're still using the 1903s, but we're also using M1 Garands and M1 Carbines and submachine guns and, and some of the more modern things that we think of at that point. There's been, you know, war, unfortunately, um, leads to a lot of development of these things. They'll put a lot yeah. of money in developing things. And I like the fact that the new things are developed and that we can use them. I'm not so happy about war. Uh, that to me is not a, a great thing to participate in, but it, the, the development of a lot of things has come about through that. You look at all of the things that the uh, space program and, and, and uh, you know, developed to use it and that kind of a thing. A lot of times when they put their money into one project in the civilian world, we get to use it for a lot of other things. Wow. Yeah, and things have come a long way. They have. They have. But I think, I mean, it, it's, it, yeah, it's really cool to see um, the history, I, I think firearms have been just such an American tradition as America. It's one of our, like, I don't know what the, what the birthright right, almost. Yeah. It's one of our birthright industries mm -hmm. really. Yeah. And so to get to see something that's like for sure a real piece of the history of firearms and the development of firearms overall, this was, this was a massive step from Mm -hmm. such slow reloading and not that smooth of operation uh, this was such a massive step in between you know what it started as to getting into what we have now you know and you look at the early muzzle loaders they were smooth bore which led to the accuracy you could hit a 10-foot yeah. circle you know kind of yeah. a thing uh, and then putting rifling in it was was a, a next step up that increased the accuracy tremendously and all these things that somebody thought of along the way somebody had to think of these it, we, we didn't go to Wikipedia and look it up and, oh, yeah, we should try this. Uh, somebody had to th think about this mechanism and how to do it and how to develop it and how to manufacture it, how to put the rifling into the barrel, how to make a, a metallic cartridge, how to make the primer. All those things had to be thought out by somebody. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the brain power on some of the things, some things are relatively easy sitting here in 2022. But if you look back, you know, a lot of these things couldn't even have been imagined Say in 1900. Yeah, seriously. So, we th we think a lot of things that we know today and it's common and it's every day would have been science fiction, you know, years earlier. Yeah. Now we're using caseless ammunition in some cases. We're using uh, energy pulse rifles. There's a lot of different things that are you know continuing on. If we were to come back in 200 years from now, we probably wouldn't recognize anything that they're using. Probably couldn't <laughs> even think about most of the things that they would be using at that point. Yeah. So, you know, the things will continue to evolve. So have you learned a little bit? Yeah, <laughs> yeah for <laughs> sure. I learned a lot. These things are so cool and so awesome. And I, and I love that they're, uh, I love that they're, yeah, they're reminiscent of, mm -hmm. of the muskets, of the muzzle loaders, because special place in my heart for those. Absolutely, absolutely. These guns, having come from a movie industry, uh, you may have seen this very gun in some movie. And not know it. There's no way that I could tell whether it was this one or not. Yeah, whether but it was it, cast. these were all used. It's like I said, you can see the studio stamps in the in the stocks here, and uh, uh, they gathered up the originals. I'm one that when I watch a movie today, you know, I look at the guns. For and, sure. And I'm I'm looking at the modifications. Like I said, when they, when they took these and, and and turned them into the, the the muskets and things with by welding a bell on the front of them. That would have been spotable. Uh, the Winchester 92s that I've got, they took the wood forend off of them, they copper pl or gold plated them, and they became imitation Henrys, uh, which oh, kind of looks like. Now, now today we have companies that are remaking a lot of these guns, so the movie studios can go out and get the modern remakes to use an actual gun. I got a part in a movie one time because I had the gun. Uh, they wanted to film a scene, and, and they, I happened to have the gun that, that, that they needed, so I got to be in the movie shooting it. So. There you go. But it was the real thing. They wanted it to be authentic enough that we wanted to have this specific one. It was a Spencer rifle. And it, it, we, we were recreating the first murder in Las Vegas back in the 1800s. So it was done with a Spencer rifle. Wow. You can see that movie today, by yeah, the way. Yeah, check out Glenn's uh, IMDb page. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, maybe that's it for right now. I'm sure... Chances are I'll think of one or two more questions and we can cover that stuff at the range. You expect to shoot these, huh? Well, I mean, we should at least you take think, them up there. You think that we should take them out, these 150-year-old antiques, and fire them up? 
I I think that we should. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they're meant for. We we have loads. I've loaded up the loads that uh, are appropriate for it. That are not going to be causing pressure problems. Like I said we're not we're not going to take off the shelf ammo. These I've I've loaded all myself. So I know what's in them. I know the charge that's in them. I know that they're proper for these guns. Uh, just a fun gun, single shot. You know, you you talk to me and you think machine guns because we've done a lot with yeah, that kind of a thing. I do. And you know that I've been involved with that industry for quite some time. But I thoroughly enjoyed taking out the single shots. This was a lot of fun to shoot. Uh, you have to make your shot count. What you're going to do? We're going to we're going to work on that a little bit, and uh, you, you'll see. This this is a real man's cartridge. A nice big fat heavy bullet there. Yeah, a good seriously. powder charge. A lot of energy. And it makes a definite impact on impact, impression on impact. Yeah, so. that thing's no joke. So cool. you think you want to shoot it? I think we should. Okay, well I may have one or two rounds, maybe three rounds sitting around with your name on it. That might be all we need. You ever had a bullet with your name on it before? I'd rather not. I think <laughs> I'd rather not. Well, we can provide it and I'll give it to you so you can decide what to do with it. <laughs> Sounds great. Yep. Trapdoor Springfield. One of the iconic Western American guns. An iconic piece of history. Yep, absolutely. All right, let me put one more through this thing just to, just for good measure. Again for the shiny nickel ones. I like them. Uh, okay. I guess I just like shiny things. Well, go ahead, take the nickel one, that's fine. You hit it. I love it. It sounds good. It hits so hard. Yep, There's it does. Good, excellent, uh, excellent indication of your hits down there. Well, I think that's it. This thing is awesome. It is nice. It I'm shoots glad soft. you like it. it I'm glad I was able to share it with you. It shoots so soft for being, like, fairly old and crude, you know? Well, man-sized cartridge there. It's not <laughs> a little wimpy 5.56 five, or anything. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, that might be my uh, that mean, might be my favorite 4570 to date. There you go. Yeah, that's awesome. So there you have it, guys. The Springfield Trapdoor Rifles. Uh, this is a lot of fun. If you ever get an opportunity to shoot one, I mean, we hope you do. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how many people have as many as Glenn, but uh, it sounds like there's a few of them floating around out there. There, there are a few around, yes. So um, fortunately, yeah. So let us know what you guys think uh, down in the comments. If you have questions, also put them there. We'll do our best to answer those. And once again, as usual, if you guys have stuff you want to see, put it down there. We'll do our best. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. And uh, see you guys on the next one. It's the perfect size for you. <laughs> Guns the size of little Bow Wow. <laughs> <laughs>